first Sunday of the month, brothers and sisters, we will not continue with Hosea. I call you this morning to Titus chapter 1. I'm currently preparing for the EPC camp. And I thought that in my preparation for the camp, I will share with you some of the things that I'm going to uh, minister to the people there in the EPC family camp in two weeks' time. So I call your attention to Titus chapter 1. I want to read for you, brothers and sisters, if you just give me attention from verse 1 to verse 4, the opening section of this epistle of the Apostle Paul to his uh, son Titus. Paul, servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested His word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior, in Titus, a true son in our common faith, praise, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. You find here, my beloved brothers and sisters, the Apostle Paul describing himself as a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Look there, in verse 1, you'll find him so describing himself. But tell me, brothers and sisters, what is Paul saying when he described himself as a servant of God and an apostle of of Jesus Christ, why did he begin most of his epistles in this way? By describing himself in relationship to God and even our Lord Jesus Christ. Is he, brothers and sisters, taking this as an example here? Was Paul seeking self-glory? That is what most of us would do. Fact, brothers and sisters, as it were, like nobody knows, we like to put our name and behind our name, we like to put all our achievements. And for some people, it can be going on long, long distance, PhD, ED, and whatever. We want the people to know and respect us. We want to give people the impression that we are somebody, you know, we, have, we, are, we are quite smart, you know, in what we do. You know, in other ways of doing, you have people driving their cars, and you have all the decor and all the sticker being put in front. Sometimes you just wonder, is it dangerous for the driver? Because it's all affecting all the angles. The front part is all full of stickers and full of things. You are belonging to this country club. You belong to that country club. You belong to this school. You belong to this place. You can drive in safely here and there. Beloved brothers and sisters, instead of being the front part of the car for the driver to look carefully, it can all get blocked by this sticker and that sticker. Why? Again, brothers and sisters, so that people will know when they will drive by, they will say, Wow, this must be somebody influential, if not rich and powerful. Look at the connection that is displayed on the front of the car. All about self. Is that what Paul was doing here? Is that why he mentioned himself as a servant of God and an apostle? Jesus Christ, that's what I want to call your attention to, brothers and sisters. Look firstly at the title, A Servant of God. You realize, brothers and sisters, if you have been reading, using the Read Through the Bible reading plan for this year with the church, you realize that if you read the epistles of Paul, you realize that this is the only place that you'll find Paul saying that he was a servant of God. Elsewhere, in the other books of the Apostle Paul, you will find that he generally described himself as a servant of Jesus Christ. For example, if you turn to Romans chapter 1, that's how Paul identified himself. He says, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. And then if you turn to the next book, to Galatians chapter 1, in verse 10, you'll find likewise the Apostle Paul describing himself. He says in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. You see that, brothers and sisters? Only here in Titus chapter 1 and verse 1, 
which you find Paul describing and identifying himself as a servant of God. Why did he call himself a servant of God? What was he trying to impart, to transmit to you? So the word servant is used in two ways in the Bible. Firstly, servant refers to somebody who is paid. A servant was somebody who is salaried. In other words, a servant is a servant and a hired person for a job and you get a pay. That's how you find the Lord Jesus Christ using this word. If you now give, give yourself to Matthew chapter 20 and verse 1, you find the use of the, this concept of servant there in Matthew 20 verse 1 and verse 2, a laborer. Matthew 20, verse 1 to verse 2, you read in this parable, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire or to employ, to engage laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denary a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And so they were paid this laborers or servant, they get a pay when the job is done and then they can go back to their house. They can go home to their loved ones. So that's the first use of the word servant, a paid worker. There is a second use and it is in this second use that you find the Apostle Paul referring and identifying himself as a servant. A servant refers to here a slave bought with a price. You become the property of the one who paid for you. You belong to the slave master. That was how the ancient slave experienced a loss of their freedom. They were bought, they were sold. They sold for some of them so poor in order to be alive. They sold themselves and so they were bought. And from freedom, they became subjected to the owner. That's a concept that you find there. Paul using in reference to himself. He said that he himself is a slave bought with a price. And he mentioned it elsewhere in the Bible. For example, in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20. If you look there in 1 Corinthians 6 and 20. You find him saying, For you were bought at a price. Therefore, Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So Paul says that if you are a Christian, you are bought with a price. You no longer belong to yourself, so it's wrong. The world can say, but you cannot. You cannot say, it's my problem. You cannot say, it's my decision. You cannot say, it's me. I can do whatever I want. Because you don't belong to yourself. You, you no longer belong to yourself. He says you are God's. You are God's property now. You are born with a price by God. And so you are God's property. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the next chapter, look at what you are told there in verse 23. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 23. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. In other words, brothers and sisters, you are bought by God for Himself. Therefore, you cannot be a servant to others. You must mind the one who owns you. You only act for and serve the persons who own you. You no longer can do for anyone else in your life. Brothers and sisters, you need to think carefully about this. Even though Paul said, Paul, a servant of God, he tells us in these verses that you as a Christian, you are in the same situation. You were lost in sin, but God found you, and when He found you, He paid a price to save you for Himself. He loved you. What is the price that God has paid for you? What is the price that God was willing to give to purchase for Himself a people? Well, if you turn with me to the Acts of the Apostles, 
You will find it there given in chapter 20 and verse 28. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20 and verse 28, where we find Paul preaching to the elders from Ephesus. Before he left them, he said these words to them. And therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. This was what he purchased with his own blood, the blood of his son Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, he did not die to be a hero. He did not die to show that he has the power to come back to life three days later. No, brothers and sisters. He died to be the prize that God paid for his people. You need to understand this. That God gave his life to purchase your life. You died in sin. You were born as sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. Your deserved place is in the fire of hell. You ought to be there. But God in his mercy, he had mercy on you. He saw you long before you were born. And he sent his son 2,000 years ago to rescue you long before you were born. Jesus already died in your place. So how grateful you ought to be, brothers and sisters. Is there anyone who loves you so much that before the person even know you, even met you, have not even seen you or spoken to you, the person already loves you so much, have already done so much for your life and your salvation? That's the picture here of our Lord Jesus Christ. God paid for you with the life of His Son. I hope you think carefully about this man. <laughs> the way you live your life, are you willing to show your gratitude to God in the way you live your life each day? Are you willing not to be angry with people who are abusing you, angry with those who are misusing you? Because you remember that the Lord Jesus Christ was so abused and misused by people that though he was not deserving of death, but out of jealousy, he heard people neglecting him and disowning him by saying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Do you trust, brothers and sisters, in the price that God has paid for his people? This is the gospel message. Do you, brothers and sisters, know that it is for the sake of His people that the Lord Jesus Christ was born? Why was He born? Why did He come to this world? Brothers and sisters, it is not because He has come to be a tourist. Look at what we are told there in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21 we read, And she, Mary, and Mary will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So you have it there again. He will save his people. How will he save his people? He will save his people by dying in their place and for them by becoming their substitute. Turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14. Look at what our Lord Jesus himself said during the, the, the time when he inaugurated the Lord's Supper. Mark 14 verse 24. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many. Jesus mentioned that his blood of the new covenant. Jesus established a new relationship for His people with God, His Father. And this relationship was established with a price. And what's the price? His blood. His life. His blood was drained, remember? When He was lifted up there, to hang up there, to dry, to, to, to die, and to be drowned, to, to, be, to, to, to draw all His blood out of His body. The spear was struck by His side and intestine and everything, the, all his internal 
things all flow out with water and blood, brothers and sisters. He gave his life for his people. That's what First Peter. If you go there to First Peter chapter one and verse 19, First Peter chapter one and verse 19. That's what Peter tells us concerning Christ, the Christ. He says, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So we have told you that the price that God paid for your life is the precious blood of Christ. Now children, do you understand this? You belong to sin. But God loves you so much, God wants you to belong to Him. But God has to pay a price for you. Just like you go to the supermarket, you go to NTUC, you want to buy chocolate. You cannot take the chocolate that will be stealing. You must pay for it. And when you pay for it, you can eat the chocolate, you can bring the chocolate home. It becomes yours. It is your chocolate now. It no longer belongs to the supermarket. The same here. You belong to sin. You belong to the fire of hell. But with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, God bought you. Now you belong to God. God can bring you home and you are kissed. You no longer belong to yourself and to sin. That's what we are told, brothers and sisters. That's what you are told there in 1 John chapter 2. Again, in 1 John chapter 2, look carefully at the price that Jesus paid for your life. 1 John chapter 2, reading for you from verse 1 to verse 2. My little children, these things I write to you, so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's what the Bible tells us. He described the Lord Jesus Christ as the propitiation. Do you know what he means? This is one of the words, brothers and sisters, that every Reformed Christian must know. You must know how to pronounce the word. He says propitiation. You must know how to spell it without looking at it. You must memorize it because it's an important word. Propitiation, it talks about two parts. Two things happened when Jesus Christ became our propitiation. When Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, He became a sacrifice to appease God's anger and wrath. He turned away the wrath of God and at the same time, He reconciled us to God. When He died, He turned God's anger away from us. And at the same time, He established a relationship for us with God. Becoming enemy is no more. But children of the living God. From enemies of God, we become children of God. That's what propitiation has accomplished for us. It changed the attitude of God toward us. God moved from being an enmity with you to being will all the way for you in love and embrace. This process of propitiation restore you to God. That's the purpose of Jesus Christ paying for you. Why did He pay for you? Why did He, why, why did he make you servants of God? Well, it is because He wants to love you. He bought you for Himself with the blood of Jesus Christ so that you can know Him and that He can be your Lord and your Master. So today, brothers and sisters, Paul says, Paul, a servant of God, you, brothers and sisters, can say the same. I am bought with a price, the Son of God's life, and I am now fully owned by God. I belong to Him. I serve Him. I'm willing to do anything. I'm willing to be a different person. I no longer react the way I reacted in the past. I am now a changed person. That is what Paul had in mind when he described himself as a servant of God. You see, it is not a title of pride 
It is not the PhD you put behind your name or the doctor you put in front of your name. I can never understand why people want to put engineer so and so in front of their name. It sounds so horrible. So you have engineer, should, should, should somebody say toilet cleaner so and so? It sounds so horrible, it's so boastful. No, brothers and sisters, just put your name will do. Just put your name. And then if you want to, just describe yourself as a servant of God. But not out of the desire to let people know you are so holy. No, it is out of a sense of the gratitude. Paul addresses himself as a servant of God because Paul wants you to know that he has never forgotten he was nobody until God made him somebody. Are you somebody today, brothers and sisters, out of your own effort? Your result was good in school and so you get a good job. And so you are somebody. You are a manager. You are a consultant. You are so and so in society. No, brothers and sisters. Let it be that you are nobody until God loved you. It's important for you to understand. To understand what Paul means by a servant of God. You can only really understand what he meant when he called himself a servant of God when you remember who he was. He was an enemy of God. You remember who he was before Jesus Christ found him? You know Paul, right? You know who Paul was? He was a Jewish rabbi before he became a Christian. He was a persecutor of the Christians before he became a promoter of the Christians. He hated Jesus Christ with such a great hatred that he went home to home to drag people out of their homes in order to kill them. But he became such a great lover of Jesus Christ that so many people became Christians because of him. That's all, brothers and sisters. You remember how he was converted? How God found him? when he was on the way to Damascus. You remember that he started the journey to Damascus as somebody who hated Jesus Christ. But when he arrived in Damascus, he was already a lover of Jesus Christ. Isn't it amazing? How you can start a journey and end a journey in a different spiritual state, brothers and sisters. I hope and I pray as your pastor, I long that all of you have, will have this such an experience too. In Acts chapter 9, you find it recorded for you. The spiritual transformation in Paul from somebody who hates God to somebody who loves God. This spiritual change, brothers and sisters, ought to be the experience of everybody here sitting in this room. There must be a before and an after. I say this again and again in your spiritual life with God. Can you please turn with me to Titus chapter 3 and verse 3 as I brought your attention to this verse before a few weeks ago. To Titus 3 and verse 3 is an example of what we all meant. Titus 3 and verse 3 we find Paul saying, For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, and he went on to describe the other sins. For you were also once foolish. Meaning to say, you were. You are not supposed to be now. You were before Christ found you. But now you, Christ has found you. You no longer remain in that unbelieving, disobedient, foolish state. So we turn to 1 Corinthians again. I'm going through these familiar verses. And I hope that you know why I'm repeating myself. Because these are verses you must take attention to because you may have to show it and read it to others. <coughs> so I hope that you are not wasting my effort by turning off your hearing and don't watch up. No, I hope you take note of these verses because these are verses that will become useful when you talk to others. The first Corinthians 6 and verse 11 you read, And such were some of you, were some of you, meaning to say, no, now, remember, now, no more. You were, but now you are a different person. Before, but now it's after. That's what the Lord wants you to learn here, brothers and sisters. 
the final verse is found in Galatians chapter 1. If you turn to Galatians chapter 1 and verse 21. In the book of Galatians <coughs> chapter 1 and verse 21. Galatians chapter 1 verse 21. Afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown by faith to the churches of Judea which were in Christ. But they were hearing only, they were hearing only, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. You realize what is happening here? They could see the change in Paul. He who persecuted us before, now is preaching the same gospel. The transformation of the Apostle Paul, brothers and sisters. And I just wonder whether you can find the same spiritual experience in your life as, as people today. When you look back and see for a time in your life where you do not know God, you do not understand the gospel. You thought that you can, by your good works and by obedience to the Ten Commandments, you can go to heaven and earn a ticket to heaven. But you come to realize now today that you can never earn enough to buy a ticket because there is no such ticket. The only way into heaven is not by the, a ticket you buy. The only way into heaven is through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the righteousness that Jesus gives to you. Entrance into heaven is a gift. It's not a reward. And then you realize how grateful you ought to be to the Lord who gives you this gift of salvation. I want to call your attention this morning to Romans 11 and verse 33 as we conclude this first point. To Romans 11, at verse 33. You find here, brothers and sisters, a Christian in worship. He says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. You see there that Paul bursts into worship, bursts into praise as he contemplated and as he pondered upon the story of his salvation. How God saw him, how God had mercy on him, how God saved him. And the same brothers and sisters ought to be your experience if you are Christian today. So when you find Paul saying, or you find Paul saying that he's a servant of God or a servant of Jesus Christ, he meant all these things. He had a before he was a servant. And now that he is a servant, he wants to serve the Lord faithfully. You look at the second, the second title that he gave himself. You find Paul saying that he's a servant of God, and then that's a general title. That's a title that all of us can use. Then he went on to give himself a specific title, an apostle of Jesus Christ. In fact, Titus chapter 1 and verse 1 should be read this way. He should read, Paul, the servant of God, and furthermore, an apostle of Jesus Christ. The word there, and, should go on with the word furthermore. Meaning to say, I am a servant of God, like most people, but I have a special calling. As a servant, you can be in a kitchen, you can be in a garden, you can be in a housekeeping, but me, God has called me to be an apostle. Now again, it is not so that Paul can be a, sh a show off or take personal pride and glory. No, uh, who is a servant of God and who is an apostle of Jesus Christ? Now what does, what does Paul mean by that? You see, a, uh, an apostle was uh, the name, a title given to somebody in ancient time who was sent out by their kings to become royal representatives. When they spoke and when they negotiated with foreign uh, government or foreign uh, kings, they could decide on behalf of the kings. They had the power as the representative of their kings to make decisions. That's an apostle. 
And so when he said that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ, Paul is actually saying, look, I have the authority from Jesus Christ to speak in his name, to teach you, to be a model to you. You ought to accept my teaching and you ought to follow my example because I have the authority given to me as an apostle from Jesus Christ who made me his rep personal representative. He claimed to be appointed by Jesus Christ himself. When he said, I am Paul and a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, he was actually saying, listen to me. I have the authority over you. Not because I want to control you, but because I have this responsibility to lead you, to teach you on behalf of Jesus Christ. Listen to me and you will be listening to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why, brothers and sisters, the church accepted the writings of Paul as scriptures. You realize that? You find the Apostle Paul's epistles there in the whole Holy Bible. And we read it as if we are reading the Word of God because he wrote the scriptures under the authority given to him by the Lord Jesus Christ who called him on the road to Damascus and appointed him to be an apostle of his. He had the power to represent. He had the power to write. That's how we are told in 2 Peter. We refer to 2 Peter chapter 3. Look at what Peter said about Paul's epistles. To 2 Peter chapter 3. Look at what you are told there in verse 14 to 16. Verses 14 to 16. 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 14 to 16. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless and consider the long suffering of our Lord is salvation as also our beloved brother Paul according to the wisdom given to him has written to you as also in all his epistles speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to understand which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. The rest of the scriptures means Paul's pieces were accepted by Peter himself as a part of scriptures. So you see here, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, he has the authority from Jesus to represent him and to teach you. And it is your duty to listen to him, to learn from him, and to model yourself after him. And so when he writes and says, I thus, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. He was actually telling Titus that Titus has a duty as a Christian to listen to Paul and to accept Paul and follow Paul's instruction because Paul was acting on behalf of Jesus. That's why we read the Bible, brothers and sisters. I have to ask you this morning as your pastor once again, are you reading your Bible? We have just entered the month of April. Are you persevering, brothers and sisters? Do you understand that the Bible was given to us through apostles and prophets appointed by God and appointed by our Lord Jesus Christ Himself? So let me just draw your attention to one. One verse in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17. To Philippians 3 and verse 17, look at what Paul tells us there. Philippians 3 and verse 17 says, Brethren, join in following my example, and not those who so walk as you have asked for a pattern. You see that? He was very clear. I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. Brethren, follow my example. Why? Because God, through Jesus Christ, appointed me to be your example. You have a duty to follow me. And how do you follow Paul today? Well, you follow Paul when you read the Bible and follow his teaching. Then you are like Paul, brothers and sisters. That was what the early church did. That's what the early church did. They understood that they had the duty to follow the apostles of Jesus Christ. So they followed. That's why you read a verse like Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 and 42. Acts 2, 42. 
you find the early church following them, he says that, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayer. Notice here, brothers and sisters, the word steadfastly. It means earnestly persevered, or they adhere closely to the teaching of the apostles. They follow so closely. And they make it a point, brothers and sisters, and a responsibility to walk so closely after the examples and teaching of the apostles. They were precise in what they believe and in how they live their lives. This is where we have sinned against the Lord. In our modern age, how many Christians have this attitude of walking as closely as they could in believing what the apostle taught and following the example set for us by the apostles. How many of us dare to say that we have done so and that has always been our daily attitude? That we want to read the Bible so that we can be precise, so that we can be accurate in what we believe and in what we follow in the example of Jesus Christ. We need to repent of this sin. I have to say this, brothers and sisters, not because I hate you or I'm using the pulpit to attack anybody. Your duty is to follow Christ and the apostles he appointed. It's not to follow the American president. It's not to follow PAP or Workers' Party. It's not to follow any other human being. It's none of your business. Don't promote what they say. Even if they achieve and even if they succeed, it's their problem. Your problem, since you have been purchased with a price, since God has purchased you to be His and fully to serve Him, why are you serving others? Why are you promoting others? Where is Jesus? Why are you not promoting Him only? He says that you are His servant. You are not His servant. You are not their servant. You are His. And I will call you to your sin. It is a sin, isn't it? We seldom walk closely with the apostles. How do you walk closely with the apostle today? Well, you walk closely with the apostle when you read this book, when you read this book, when you follow this book. If you don't read this book, you are definitely, brothers and sisters, whatever else it may be, you are definitely not even precise in following him. I want you to take note that Paul was very careful in what he wrote. So if we turn back to Act, uh, Titus chapter 1 and verse 1, you please be careful of what he writes. Look at what he said. He said, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. I don't want you to take note that every word in the Bible is important. You realize that he did not say, Paul, the servant of God. And the, servant, the apostle of Jesus Christ, he never used the word the. He said an apostle. He's one out of the twelve. You don't follow me because I'm not the only apostle. You have a duty to follow the apostles of Jesus Christ, of whom I'm only one of them. That's why in the Bible, you have Paul's writings, you have Peter's writings, you have the other books written there by James and Jude and John, brothers and sisters. The other apostles. <coughs> Paul is not asking you to follow only him as if he's the Pope. No, brothers and sisters. You follow Christ and the apostles and prophets that he has sent to you. The question is, are you? It has always been the same question. Are you, brothers and sisters, are you persuaded by the scripture that you have a duty to walk closely, as closely as you can every day with the apostle of Jesus Christ in the Bible? 
You see, the word persuade is a Bible word. The word persuade means to be convinced. You are convinced. When a person is convinced, a person shows it in his life or a life. The word is a Bible word. I want to call you to a familiar verse in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. It says that, For this reason I also suffered this thing, nevertheless I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that, to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Persuaded, convinced, beyond reasonable doubt, there is no shadow, not even a tiny little uh, unsure in my heart. I am absolutely sure. Persuaded. Paul says, I am a servant of God. I am one of the apostles Jesus Christ has appointed. Are you persuaded? Are you persuaded that it's your duty to follow Paul because Paul represented Christ? It's important then, brothers and sisters, that you show that in your life you are really convinced about this truth. Are you convinced that when Jesus died, that he affected you? Are you convinced, brothers and sisters, because let's be honest, we can see whether other people are convinced or not by their actions. If you say you are convinced but you continue to live the same, there is no before and there is no after in your life, you are not convinced. But if you are convinced, there must be a before and now there must be an after in your Christian life. Can you turn to John, the Gospel of John chapter 15. To the Gospel of John chapter 15, please. And let me conclude this morning's service by reading for you verse 1 to verse 6. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch, and is withered. And they gather them, and throw them, into the fire and the earth. I was not. I hope you get the point. That you ought to abide with Christ. How do you abide with Christ today? <clears throat> you abide with Christ when you accept the teaching of His apostles, when you follow their examples in service and love. I ask you this morning as your pastor, Will you accept what I say this morning in God's name? And will you be persuaded that you need to repent of your sin? You have failed so many years of your life. You have failed in this duty. You are not walking closely to the apostles. You are not steadfast in following Christ. You have not been doing so as a servant of God. You have not been following the apostles of Jesus Christ. You see, in the future, when you think of Paul as an apostle of Jesus Christ, as a servant of God, I hope you will bring to your mind that he was bought with a price just like you. 
And he now belongs to God fully. He will only serve God. He will not allow anybody else to enlist them, to employ them, to serve them. The glory of Jesus Christ is greatest. He's not going to help anybody else be glorified. He only wants to have one person to receive all the glory, all the praises. He will only regularly mention one name. Jesus Christ. I hope that this is also your desire after today. Our Father, 